Good evening, everyone. You know, uh, as a moderator, this is a kind of a dream session. It uh, encompasses so much of different periods of my life. So those of you who are of a certain vintage and from India, and especially Indian small towns, uh, you'd remember reading Archie comics, right? We all grew up with that. Our ideas of America, to quite an extent, was shaped by that quintessential American group in a small town called Riverdale, right? Nancy will, the co-CEO, will talk about Archie Comics, its modern iterations, um, its role about reading and students. Um, then in the early 2000s, I left for London. You know, and the loneliness that comes with moving to different lands. Um, I discovered another hero of mine who's here today, uh, Sarnath Banerjee. Sarnath's, Sarnath's work evokes such nostalgia, such humor, such joy. For the past 20 years, I've been wanting to meet him, and I'm so delighted to finally uh, make your acquaintance, Sarnath. And, Very generous, uh, thank you. Kelly's work is far more recent to me. The last couple of weeks, I've been going over the, his recent book, the sketches, the way he uses color, his thoughts on healing, and the use of color, and we'll talk about that, Kelly. Uh, Nancy, let me start with you. Uh, one of your primary passion is about teaching and education and reading and children reading. And you talk about comics as a way for children to start reading and get into the world of books. Uh, how do you see Archie's comics and children and education and reading? Well, first, Zam, wham, wow, Jaipur. This is my second time being in your great city. So I am th so thrilled to see so many faces at this event. Um, you mentioned that we all grew up with Archie Comics. I did not. <laughs> I married into the Archie comic kingdom. My father-in-law, Louis Soberclay, started Archie Comics with John Goldwater Sr. in 1941, 80 years ago. And each of those gentlemen had a son. And the sons, when their fathers passed away, they had been in the business, but they held on to the stock and they brought Archie Comics into second generation. It was about maybe 16 years ago, my husband's business partner, Richard Goldwater, passed away. Shockingly, seven months later, my husband passed away. And no one was running Archie Comics. There were people there. They knew how the, you were getting your comic books. But I was left half of the company and everyone wanted my stock. There were a bunch of sharks that wanted that stock. But my background was an educator, an art teacher. Do teachers go into their careers to think about becoming wealthy? No. So I was offered the position of co-CEO. I think they thought I was gonna go very quickly. But I had a problem, as I said, I never read an Archie comic. I had to start bringing home those comic books and learning a lot more than the little I knew. I would pile up books that made me laugh, ones with impactful messages, beautiful covers. And then one day, I felt I didn't have enough pages to turn. I mean, if you go to the bookstore, I'll be there signing and selling books or out in the corner. They're big now, but when I was growing up, they were very little. And I started going to bookstores, buying books, buying novels. I'll have to get your novel. And I fell in love with reading at age 54. And I said to my mother, what, what happened? This comic book just got me into reading. She goes, you didn't want to read. So I started thinking about where I was when Archie Comics is usually introduced to young people. I was going into second grade. I hope I'm not, you can cut me off, go back to the green room. Um, I was going into second grade, and when you're stepping up, that's a big thing. 
I remember what I was wearing that day. I was looking smart. I even had white patent leather shoes to match my, uh, my outfit. I polished them with Vaseline. That's what we did then. So we're going to, you know, school after summer. It was still warm out. I remember the day clearly. And there on the playground, they had banners of where you line up. I saw the second grade banner. I'm ready to bound out of my mother's um, arms, hands, to go there. And she tugs me. She says, no, you're not going there. You're going over there. You're going back to first grade. You have been retained. You have been left back. You're doing another year of first grade because you cannot read. That was about the best my mom could do. She didn't, she told me it broke her heart during that whole summer to tell me. And I feel it was that moment that stole the love of reading from me. I remember my second first grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Charmer. She was no charmer. She was old and very wrinkled and scary. And the books she gave me and the remedial material, I twisted it and I folded it and I shoved it into my little handbag to hide my shame. My dear late husband, Michael I. Silberkleit, he never knew I was retained. I hid that for decades. And when I found the love of reading at age 54, I go around to many illiterate groups who cannot read as adults, and I give them the confidence that they, it is not their fault. They are not stupid. They are not dumb. It is who presented reading to you how they presented reading to you, it just kind of clicks. And people like that sitting here with me that know how to pencil, they know how to excite the eyes and the critical thinking to, you know, see the language, see the words in their mind, even if they can't read. And it compels them to want to connect the words to those pictures. And magic happens in the brain. And you welcome that, um, you know, first time reading. I grew up to be an art teacher. If they had only handed me a comic book. But the yin yang, I get to tell this story and encourage you. Let our young people read whatever they want, if it's pictures. And one day, even if it's age 54, they find the love of reading. Um, it's a wonderful gift. Reading is a wonderful gift. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. You know, um, I wish you had met my dear late father who used to keep hiding all my comic books every time I brought them home. <laughs> and India is the worst, I hate to say. I hear from so many of my friends, they would get in trouble with their RG comics. And many of you can relate to this. In your chemistry class, you had that comic book right there and the book was open just, you know, to get in your comic books because if your parents found them. Yeah. So I hear many wonderful stories and you are one of our largest fans. We are popular around the world, but I can't thank you enough. And come see me um, selling and signing books over at the bookstore. And I think they're setting up something outside here. Sanat, I'll come to you next. Um, yeah. Your work, Sanat, is rooted in the alleys and lanes people have forgotten. Nostalgia, humor, they play such a role in your work. To me, and I've read all your published books, your work is a profound reflection of urbanity and the crisis that hypercapitalism brings in its wake. Would you want to just reflect a little bit, and I don't want to make this too serious because humor is, your, is where you play at, that how in a world which leaves things behind so quickly, uh, which is after the next big thing, how do you make your work relevant? There's so much stillness in your work and there's so much politics and so much humor. Um, so, as I was telling Nancy earlier that I write children's stories for adults because often happen in adult spaces, particularly masculine adult spaces, imagination has taken a back seat Mostly people like sit and, you know, trade information, whether it's financial information, news information. When imagination is uh, what I feel uh, 
helps us to heal, deal, to kind of, you know, get us past those like hurdles in life, you know, kind of. And uh, I feel like there's uh, comics for me is a, is, a, is a world which exercise that muscle, that imagination muscle where people can kind of create. So for example, you don't really need to be constantly be in a state of anger or uh, in a state of um, uh, strife. You don't have to kind of give up when I, all the things that are breaking down all around us. You don't have to reiterate them in like, in just mere like chunks of information. You can process them, you can create speculative worlds around them. You can bring ghosts into comics. Because I mean, comics, uh, Nancy was talking about reading and readability of comics. For me, comics is compositional, it's musical. And it has a lot to do with um, the process of, you know, spending a lot of time by itself and it kind of opens up worlds that you have to imagine because you're always constantly in collaboration. I create the world inside you through comics. I never really tell you. And that's, I think, the power of comics, and which is why it's easier to kind of deal with some of the most pertinent question or ask the most pertinent questions that we face these days. Yeah. You know, before I come to Kelly, I have one more uh, thing I, I want to pursue with you, Sarnath. Uh, much of your work is taken up with losers. In this world where we strive for excellence, we need killer instinct. You have this uh, amazing ability to um, not necessarily make heroes out of losers, but focus on the losers. You know, what happens to those who very few win? What happens to us who've been left behind? Would you want to talk a bit about losing and Bengaliness? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like it reminds me of like one of the, I did a series for the Olympics, uh, a, a set of murals in the city of London and got respectability from doing that, which is basically, it was called the Gallery of Losers, where I put together uh, in large billboards across London, uh, people uh, at the brink of winning, they're almost making it, but not making it. So like Ilya, the weightlifter who can pick up just about anything, except when no one is watching. Or a boxer who enters a, a ring thinking how many punches does he have to, uh, you know, just dodge rather than how many he makes. So, uh, loser, uh, I think, uh, uh, as I'm getting older, my comics is also getting older. And now tomorrow, if say Penguin or HarperCollins says that, you know, uh, tomorrow, uh, Sarnath, you're really irrelevant. The kids don't read you anymore. So I'll still do comics. You know, it's now become like more like an internal activity. It is what I, it's the language I speak. It, it taught me a lot, it taught me how to slow down uh, to accept myself, the process of actually meticulously sitting quietly for hours and hours, trying to get that um, mood, because comics is a very atmospheric thing. You're not actually telling much. much. It's like, a, imagine a drone which can take you to places without actually, but can't carry too much payload. So it'll take you to corners of your, so it's actually, actually kind of a, a process where you, where you, where it's a contemplative space and it's, it's like a practice, like riyas, you know, it's like, you know, sitting and in the morning and like doing your, uh, your scales and things like that. So I feel um, you know, losers, uh, I, celebrating losers is, uh, well, that was part of the project, but I just feel like we are in a very triumphant world, you know, everything is so optimized. You have to maximize everything. The whole thing is about like, you know, I have to seize the, what was the Sol Bello book? Seize the day? Seize, seize the, the day. day. Seize the day, kind of a, this projecting. This is, and I, I'm just like kind of, kind of swimming against it. I would be quite happy to not seize the day because it has, it gives people ulcer and <laughs> constipation famously. So I'm happy. It's taught me. Comics teaches me. I do comics, it teaches me a lot while doing it. Thank you, Sanat. I mean, you know, it's an easy space now for me to move into Kelly's work where Sanat is talking about healing, about contemplation. Kelly's work, which I've just recently seen. I mean, one of the problems has been, Kelly, that I haven't got the book. I've got it in PDF format and it's difficult to read. Such ruminative, um, contemplative, reflective work on a screen. But uh, would you want to tell us a little bit more about colors and healing and 
rainbows. This is what you're, you know, and of course you've touched a lot on religion, but let's start with colors and healing. Uh, hello, everybody. Firstly, I must say, I am among very great illustrated company. Uh, do, uh, Phantomville, Archie's, fabulous. Um, in so many ways, I am sitting here today because I felt a relation to what these great cultures offer and what we have experienced through our upbringing. They are iconographic, what they do, which is very much what I have taken on in my work. I have just gone and chain-balled Buddhist iconography, crushed it up into uh, amalgamated images of what I felt, what I was going through, my own interpretations of uh, healing and uh, culture, spirituality. And then my darling Meeta Kapoor, if she is here, I want to thank you for being my literary agent and for hammering my head every day and, and telling me, oh, you need to explain what you're doing. So I had to write a little bit about it and explain. So what I have done is just offered you my own interpretations of uh, an introduction to Buddhism and spirituality as I know it. And it's not limited to religion. I very much have a few uh, allusions to uh, my, who I consider a great guru to me as well, is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar uh, from The Art of Living. So having said that, I understood that coloring is a very great form of healing. And I related to that because I would take these Archie comics as I was growing up and I would spend my time on, in the toilet or otherwise yes. with it very much clasps, clasped to my chest, uh, <laughs> especially in the classrooms where we would disguise it under the cover of our biology book, which shared the very much same size as, <laughs> as these Archie comics. And we had them in these bigger A4 size ones and the smaller, thicker editions. So we couldn't get enough of these uh, books. So I want to thank you for uh, nurturing my interest in uh, iconography from that stage. Um, having said that, the colors that I offer are absolutely nil. I started my book out with zero colors offered and no suggestion otherwise. I don't want anyone to feel, oh, you should do this and you should do that. I just offer you an iconography from a timeless culture and you go ahead and color into it no matter how you feel, it doesn't matter. There's no conformity. There's no way that it should be. You do your own thing. It follows the principle of the Buddha where he says, don't believe what I'm saying you should go and experiment and experience it for yourself and then you will find your own way. Thank you. May I just yes, interject? Um, this format of graphics, it compels the reader to be a co-writer, a co-author. It, it compels you to expand the story. And it's in between those gray lines that you start internalizing the story with your values. And that's where, you know, you calm down and you, you, you're part of these characters. And especially, you know, Archie, they are you. You see real life people. Our characters are like the proportion of the human anatomy. So it draws people to see themselves and expand the story in, in their terms. And it really gets them lost. And so and for you know what you were talking about is mental wellness. I have met so many people around the globe that tell me these heartwarming stories where in their family there was abuse or alcoholism and they would just go take their Archie comics and get lost in the panels. One of the most recent stories was a man that lived in the South, South Bronx in the 70s, where if you went outside, you could be killed. And he was a little boy knowing this. And he told me his home, what got him through life was Archie Comics because he found himself in Riverdale. He says that was his home and Archie and Betty and Veronica and Jughead and all the, were his friends. And one day he wanted to live 
in Riverdale. I was shocked when I heard this from this grown man, but it's what helped him get through his life when things were, were tough. So comic books are amazing because they have you being the collaborative. They have you being the part of being the storyteller because you expand it. So I think that's what you, know, you two gentlemen were, were saying. So I'm sorry yeah, to no, no, interrupt. No, 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 that's all right, Nancy, but I, I, want, I have another question for you. Um, Archie comics have changed a lot politically since I last read them. Would you want to take us through how in the 21st century Archie has, you know, it was in the 1940s, how it has kept itself relevant? Well, Archie Comics has a formula. It's to put a bunch of kids in a high school, so, you know, you all went to high school, throw in a little chaos, and then let them figure it out without any adult interaction. So think about that. They were always solving everything. But our creative team always threw in the decade. But also, you know, this third generation, Archie Comics is a family business. I, my background was an art teacher. We always take chances. Um, my um, partner, John Goldwater, is in the music business. We, he takes chances. You never know if you're going to have a good band or a bad, bad song or whatever. But I can tell you, when my husband and his partner, Richard, they wouldn't even put the word Bloomingdale's in their book because they were afraid they were going to be sued. It would be, you know, kind of another name. And then I would say, well, why don't you do a story about the Mets or the Yankees? Can't do that. Everyone will be angry. So they didn't take a lot of chances. But um, the third generation publishing Archie, we've become very diverse. And we have have tried, you know, many different types of stories. Riverdale, if you saw that, it was very dark. But uh, people see themselves, and I feel that's why the beat goes on, um, because it's relevant, and it's also the art of conversation. Archie somehow gets people talking about, did you see what was on Riverdale, or did you read that in the digest? But I know we've changed a lot, but I feel it's because the people behind the company were taking chances, and we are being relevant. We're reflecting who society is and who is in our society schools. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, talking about Archie. I saw that picture. That was me in India. <laughs> um, when I first stepped into Archie Comics, Fortune Magazine came to do an article on me, and it was called Accidental Boss. They come to take a picture of me, and they finally say, don't you have, like, you know, something else to wear, a business suit. I had my hair in a ponytail. I was wearing a gray, um, no makeup, a gray thing. They said, don't you have a Hillary Clinton pantsuit? This was me. It was me as the art teacher. Well, when I went to India, I had smartened up. I became more business-like. And I was wearing, you know, Archie Orange. I had a jacket on. But that was taken in New Delhi at a hotel in a hotel room when I started looking business-like. Uh, but my very first picture in Fortune, I just looked like Nancy, the art teacher that just got thrown into the frying pan, a family business. I love that point to choose. Uh, Sanat, if I may come back to you, uh, you're intrinsically a funny man, you make us laugh, right? And you have used humor against power all the time. I mean, I, I'm reminded of Jean Baudrillard who said that there's no better takedown of power than to be able to laugh at it. Could you just talk us through the use of humor in your work and um, its role? in laughing against you know, uh, the larger powers of the state? <clears throat> I don't set out to be funny. I don't think I'm actually, when I try to be funny, I'm not funny. Um, so I'm not very good at jokes and stuff like that, but because I, my work is essentially about the, the spoils of an urban living, and our urban living is the specificity of the, the, the world that we live in, um, itself, and now, of course, most of the politicians are going to, um, you know, make us un unemployable because I don't think they need any humor. Because they create the the level of humor they create themselves, they'll make us redundant pretty soon. So you basically just portray what you see, 
and humor you know it's a bit like you know it's 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 like your accent you know you just really can't suddenly become you you might i think of myself very i mean i take myself very seriously i think i'm a serious uh, but people laugh but i mean that's not my fault that uh, people laugh when i try to be serious and it's actually a tragedy that uh, when when you want to be when when uh, so yeah so humor is a, is i think it's it's just an accent it's just like a way of it's a nazaria the way you look at things the way um it's more whimsical than actually funny if that answers your question uh i don't set out to be to be funny at all actually but there's a way you uh look at there's a there's a certain viewpoint which makes people laugh let's forget that you set out to be funny but you find that people laugh at your you know laugh with you at things you are poking fun at you, you i mean you could I, i what i'm trying to say is that you do not take kindly to power you take you know you are upset about things and those things are reflected in your work and you evoke it through humor and people laugh with you so is it a mechanism is it a, i mean or is this completely unconscious that you use humor to or am, am i reading too much into your work well if you look at the i mean the middle class that surrounds us which i mean we also belong to um of of indian middle class the the way they understand power is very interesting often i mean initially when we were like starting off there, there was a there was a general sense of like being um sort of resisting power but now seem there should be like a general win win uh, people seem to side the winners a lot more so it seems like you have to w- winning is a virtue so uh, people tend to side with the winning team whichever uh, they are that wasn't really like that when you and i were growing up you always went for the underdog bollywood was always the underdog now it's nobody's an underdog they all like very flashy they all like sort of seem to be very comfortable they are in a family who everybody respects each other it's all very sort of harmon- harmonious and stuff like that and i kind of i think there's a problem with that it seems i think it's it's, a, it's the reflection of a very diseased society personally i feel when everybody sort of you know accepts that sort of uh, that happiness all all around uh, sort of a thing um and because i what you might find fun, funny is the specificities that uh, we work with so i'm i'm sure like archie also works with the specificities which have become global because in yeah. american specificities the world accepts it because it has become grammatical but i mean we also find our specificities that that are funny and uh, in that sense um the local becomes um, important and i kind of you know i worship the local i'm very much part of that sort of you know the the world that i've i've grown up in so i think all that the the humor is in the tap water you drink so it just sort of you know you have it and it just comes out it just um yeah i i think that probably is sure yeah uh, kelly i'll come back to you now kelly um you are a model you are an actor you are a philosopher and you now uh writing how do you combine all these three uh, all these worlds of yours and and um talks um and this uh, this philosophy that you uh, you're working with of healing of buddhism of syncretic religion um how how do you combine all these worlds very badly i might add <laughs> uh i can't seem to say no i just keep taking on more and more into my life but uh i think my philosophy is just uh, do what you want to do love to do uh, follow your heart not your head especially if your head isn't saying much <laughs> uh i have two slides i believe you want to show them yeah, uh, so go ahead i think yeah. people might uh, understand what i am talking about yeah. uh a little bit more would somebody put on uh, kelly's slides please um uh, yeah the iconographic images that i combine are very much uh centuries old uh, artisanal work where in bhutan particularly artists would wake up every single day and draw the same thing for 6 or 7 years every single day they'll wake up and they'll go they'll draw that same hand those clouds those mountains those birds the flowers every single day they'll practice how it was done in a time old practice i have just gone and 
put it together in a contemporary sense and made collective Im uh, images to mean something of my own. In this particular piece, uh, it's called Om is the Center. And it's just a little playful piece which I would like my readers to identify uh, and find where the Om is in the picture. So if anybody can see it, uh, you're welcome to shout it out or I'll point it out to you. Um, if you look into the palm of the, of the hand, at the bottom you'll see the uh. And the wheel above that in the center of the palm is the ma. So that is the symbol of om. So it's just little playful things for people to have fun with in iconography. I never studied how to publish or draw an iconographic book. I never studied to be uh, trained in iconography, but I did take uh, a few lessons and uh, theoretical uh, practices with uh, known lamas in Bhutan. And that's why. And there's a second imagery, if, uh, if I can point it out to you. Um, it's based on a, a Buddhist phenomena. Could we have the second one, please? Sorry, there, I think there is. Is there a second? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. This particular piece depicts the rainbow body of light. It's a Buddhist phenomena where they say that when you, if you can attain a form of enlightenment, you can go through the a phenomena called the rainbow body of light, which in turn has three categories. The first one being the rainbow body of light, where your, when you are coming to the end of your physical form, you get encircled by an, a halo, some sort of light that surrounds you. And people can actually experience this. And then the second stage is the rainbow body of transcendence where your body starts glowing and you're again engulfed in light. And when you finally leave this world, your body shrinks to about one-eighth or one-ninth the size of your actual human physical form over a period of two or three weeks. And then you just disappear into a ball of light. And then the final one is the rainbow body of, of great transcendence, where your body disappears into a form of light and that light doesn't extinguish, it remains. That I still have yet to uh, witness or hear about in the Buddhist world, but the other two I have heard about and I witnessed the first one. So I found it really fascinating and I wanted to bring it across in an art form and speak a little bit about it so that people can color into it and have fun with it. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, we still have a little bit of time left. Uh, Nancy, I know you might not like this question, but I've been told to ask this. Did you see the movie, The Archies? Six times. <laughs> Six times. You're the I, only one. Six times. <laughs> six and times. every time I six watch times. it, I find something else. That movie is fabulous. It's fabulous. And I encourage people to watch it again and again. And what India may not know, it had, I believe, um, people globally who see it are going to have a great desire to come and visit your country. That was shot in Uti. And boy, I can't wait to get to Uti and find all of those scenes where uh, the Archies was shot. Fabulous movie, just fabulous. And the actors, you know, a lot of them I know, they, you know, had a lot of clout behind them. And sometimes when kids are growing up and, you know, affluent families, they can, you know, get maybe, 
you know, sidetracked and not be doing things. I really have to hand it to these actors how they are focused, and they did a marvelous job, marvelous. So, so much about that film, you know, besides the, the oh, the music. I can't wait to get the track. I heard um, it's waiting for me in New Delhi. I've had someone search for the CD for me. I'm just, you know, I don't like stream. I have a CD player and I put it in. So I can't wait to listen to it all the time. Music fabulous. So, there's so much about it. So I'm going to watch it seven times. That's wonderful. Eight times. Zoe Akhtar will be very happy. <laughs> uh, okay, I, the three of, uh, three of our panelists, so I'll take a question each for each of them, right? Uh, so let's, questions for Sarnath. Anyone, hands up for Sarnath Banerjee? We'll come back to Sarnath. Yes, uh, uh, Sarnath, would you, do you have uh, something to show us here on screen or should we um, uh, have the book signings later where you'll show them? The works are available, uh, but not in an electronic form right now, yeah. but the bookshop. Yeah, the bookshop has it, and Sarnath's work, I mean, it's been for the last 20 years that his books have been coming out. So do, do have a look. Uh, is that for Sarnath? Yes, please, go ahead. Hello. Uh, so my question is uh, that I have read two of your wo uh, works, The Corridor and The, the Owl, The Barnacle Owl. Sorry, I forgot the title. Yes, the one with the owl. So in both of the works, uh, instead of staying uh, in monotonous ink, you have juxtaposed some color format of the comics and some real world images. So if, uh, what was your inspiration or why was that a decision? If I can get some insight into that. Um, unfortunately, there's no short answer for that, but uh... Uh, I used a lot of, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a street artist. I spend a lot of time on the streets and I, uh, I don't really actually have a studio. I like work mostly and I spend like a stray dog. I'm like always outside and drawing uh, and uh, working sometimes with watercolor because I started also doing watercolor sketches because with watercolor you can also like make lines at the same time, make shapes. And while you are um, drawing outside in the streets, a uh, lot of the conversation that happened around the streets, so suppose you are in Bombay, in a place like say Dadar or Makar Pakadi, you see conversations that are happening around, you know, like fight has broken, domestic battles with mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. Then you see a poster of a Pahalwan, a wrestling match that is about to happen, or someone who's selling some kind of a local Viagra. Uh, you know, which is going to enhance your sexual prowess by, yeah, snake oil by like 27 seconds uh, on nightfall. Like I'm, I'm obsessed with uh, sex enhancing drugs. I think, I mean, I'm fine, but it's just that it's an intellectual. <laughs> you haven't found one yet. Intellectual interest. <laughs> so Bengalis have a lot of intellectual interest in these things. It's history of strength, for example. Look, as I said, he's not funny. Huh? So it's just no, it's not why. What's funny about that? Uh, so, and you, I sometimes feel that some of these worlds can be created through color because that, you know, that shocking pink or that really like orange, like orange with a headache orange uh, kind of stuff that comes out in color and also a lot of photographs. And um, it's a long answer. So perhaps uh, we can talk about it later. So it kind of creates like a visual texture, so to say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, question for Nancy. No one wants to ask about their Archie Comics CEO stuff? Nothing? What do you want next? Yeah, there you go. Since Archie, I've, I've grown up reading Archie Comics, and there's this traditional uh, Archie, you know, the sweater with the Riverdale R and everything written on it. Sorry. <laughs> so, would there be change in the, you know, the costumes? of the characters going forward? Um, I think you, you noted about, you were talking about the little um, things that we have, uh, like the, the letter R on Archie's sweater, would we change it? Yeah. No. <laughs> Intellectual property um, is huge. Um, this is a new character um, who represents the autistic population. 
I said I was a teacher um, for 25 years in the art room. We had in our school um, autistic children who were mainstreamed, and it's a whole long story, but it was very important to me when I entered Archie to be relevant and reflect the autistic population. They desire friends. And um, they may not be speaking or verbal, but they know everything that's going on. So I created that character. If you could bring her up against Scarlet Salty. Her mother is from the Philippines. Her father's from Ireland. But creating her IP is about her is about flowers. She loves to wear shoes with flowers. She's obsessed with it. So that cannot change. That will always be there, just like Archie's letter R and Jughead's hat with the red circle and the white rectangle. People think that has a secret message, but that is part of their intellectual property, just to build the character, because Jughead's hat, anybody can put a, cra a crown on a character. Anybody can have a gray cat crown, but no one can have a crown with a red circle and a white rectangle. And we've been consistent for 80 years, and every once in a while you'll see Jughead not wearing that crown. But those little things that you notice, people think they're secret messages and they're curious about them. So thank you for noticing it, and it will never change. <laughs> Uh, may I ask a question? Please. I'm sorry if anybody out there wants to. Uh, this question is for the both of you, really. I would like to know if you are considering merchandising and creating 3D, more uh, everyday uh, ownable artifacts out of your artworks. Uh, I know Archie's has a limited uh, merchandising as far as we are concerned here in Asia. But, uh, and we'll come to that, but for Sarnath especially, because he's got very important social dialogue, and I wonder if you have uh, considered merchandising for that, because I do know a lot of people who, uh, who have on their mugs, for example, you know, don't, what, evil, evil until coffee, you know, things like that. <laughs> so maybe one of your characters with his little... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, you know, Kelly, I'll mull over that question while, because uh, we've only got four minutes. Okay. So I'll let you answer your question. Yes. Um, and then if you still have time, then I'll answer your question very quickly. Uh, is there a question for Kelly? Yes, right, right here at the front. Uh, Hi. Um, in many sense, India is a uh, you know, culture steeped in oral traditions, you know, speech, chanting of hymns, and we seek spiritual experience through that. Contrast that with written words and images, which in some sense allows you to distance yourself from the author or the speaker and the experience. Is that where you source your spirituality from? And just wanted to contrast that. Well, actually, oral culture in most, almost all cultures, is integral. It is the nucleus of the family, of the community, that hands down what has come before. It is very, very important, and the foundations of iconography and whatever else you see, those are not independent forms that have arisen on their own. They are a result of rebellion against oral traditions. So my own approach to iconography and the representation of art, or maybe all artists for that matter, is taking from what was orally passed down and visualizing it and offering a different dialogue or a different channel, speaking the same language, essentially. So that's how I always looked at it. I approached this entire project of mine in iconography very much through oral transition. In fact, I didn't even speak to other artists or uh, lamas who were doing iconography to start with. I started speaking to weavers from villages who were weaving traditional patterns into clothes, into what I wear and mostly what women wear that have motifs. 
because those are oral traditions and counts passed down. They're not, there's no uh, written down science or thing to it. It's an oral tradition passed down. So I started with that, the patterns on, 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 on textiles, if that answers your question. Thank you. Um, I've got a minute. Uh, I'll, yes, la the last question, this one. Hello. You mentioned that uh, Kelly is an actor in his introduction. So I just want to know what films have you acted in? <laughs> uh, you must be too young to remember, ma'am. <laughs> Um, I've done about 33 films in my career that spanned from Bombay down into Andhra Pradesh. I am a Telugu actor uh, from regional cinema, for most of you who don't know where that is. Uh, I've done a whole, I've covered the whole spectrum of South Indian cinema from Telugu to Tamil to Kannada and Malayalam. Malayalam. Um, and some, some of my more popular films, uh, those that made it uh, successful in the box office would have been films like Dawn Number no. One or debatably Ek Ajnabi, uh, films like that. It's ah. wonderful, Kelly. Thank uh, do you speak all these languages? <laughs> I can vomit them out. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we've come to the, uh, there's no more time left. Um, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in giving our panelists, a very big hand. Thank you so much.